All right. And yes, the the you've all been participating in the cultural event of roguelike celebration, and we are moving right along. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, yeah, so now we have Gabriel Koenig. Uh, Gab is passionate about many creative outlets, including games, music, visual arts, and performance. He enjoys experimenting with weirder ideas and looser styles. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to have you at the conference this year. I'm a fan of, of your work. Thanks, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so go ahead and take the floor. Okay, yeah, thanks for joining for my, for my talk. Uh, it's called Good Mutation, Bad Mutation, Player Agency, and Procedural Generation. Uh, the focus of the talk will be on my own experience using procedural generation across multiple game projects and how my perspective has shifted over that time, specifically with an interest in extending the joys of playing with procedural systems to the player. So my name is Gabriel Koenig. Uh, I've been releasing games since 2013 under the name Ghost Time Games. I'm a self-taught programmer and learned Unity 3D and C-Sharp while making my first game by myself. And I typically go work alone because of uh, no budget, and I think largely because of my limited capacity of being a solo developer. I quickly turned towards procedural generation as a powerful tool to make games bigger than I would be able to make otherwise. And you can see a couple of my games there that I'll be talking about today. So the first time I did anything with uh, procedural generation was during a game jam where I created an infinite space for a small rocket ship to fly. And using procedural generation, I was able to populate a given space on the fly with a collection of predetermined celestial objects, which is super simple, but exciting for me at the time. So after a bit of time working professionally as a programmer, I started working on my most ambitious project today, which is Jet Omero, Hero of the Universe. So I'm gonna play the trailer just to give you a sense of the game. So around the time that I started making Jet Omero, uh, No Man's Sky had also been teased, which was a huge inspiration for me. The idea of being able to fly through space and land on random unique planets really stuck with me and ended up becoming a major component of Jet Omero. Uh, I used procedural generation to deform planet measures, place objects on planets, pick coordinated colors, and I created a procedural animation system that combined with the physics system to create a unique wacky walking style for the type of character. Also the enemies, which you can see here, uh, we're all complex physics rigs that grafted together three modern parts. So early on in the process of making Jet Omero, I found myself compelled to document almost every procedural iteration of space, knowing that it would all be gone again forever as soon as they stopped running the game. And I was taking so many screenshots of generated planets that I soon developed an in-game photo mode for easier mobility. And I wasn't expecting to spend so much time just taking photos during development, but I couldn't help myself. The procedural generation was like a creative collaborator for me, and I was always excited to see what it would come up with next. Being able to take photos in the game was a way for me to creatively engage with procedural generation. It was becoming more than just randomized levels because I was involving myself in that process now, even in such a small way as to choose where to place my camera before snapping a screenshot. And I think this was what kept development interesting for me, because every time I played the game it was different from the last time, and I had the opportunity to pull something new from it. For me, I think the process of developing a game itself often feels like a game. There are rules, objectives, success and fail states. It's, it's a complex puzzle, and I'm constantly interacting with systems and trying to create viable realizations of my goals. And unfortunately, once the game is finished, that is ready for public consumption, none of those elements are present for the player anymore. 
So by the time I released Jet Omero, I started to realize while watching complete strangers play the game on live streams, it didn't really matter if the game used procedural generation. Plenty of people probably wouldn't even notice that it was all randomly generated because they'd play through once and that would be it. I could have manually constructed every element of the game and it would have been nearly identical for the casual player. Now, I still love Jet Omero for what it is, but looking back, I think a lot of the excitement I had developing the game was lost in translation. There was no way to share that experience of creation with my audience, at least it wasn't part of the main game. There was a handful of players that would go on to invest hours of extra time in exploring the game's photo mode, and for a game that only took around two, three hours to complete the main story, this meant they'd often put in more time with pure exploration than anything else. The opportunity for the player to explore the procedural systems seemed most relevant when it also offered a form of creative engagement, in this case, the game's photo mode. Moving on from Jet Omero, I had some loose concepts floating around in my head for what I want to try to do next. And I've been keenly watching the development of Wobble Dogs, which used physics and procedural generation in combination with the mutable genome idea. Uh, the mutation idea strongly appealed to me. So my original concept was something reminiscent of Spore, growing an organism up from a very basic form, only instead of using manual manipulation of its every physical feature, I want to use procedural generation to mutate organisms. And it would be the player's job to guide this process without ever having direct control. This concept, unfortunately, seems slightly beyond my abilities and scope, at least with regards to finding a way to generate physics-based organisms from scratch in a way that did just end up with useless writhing tentacles 99% of the time. With machine learning, I believe something exciting could emerge from this concept, but I had to simplify if I was going to get anywhere with no budget. So inspired by the fact that many players seem to love knocking over buildings in Jet Omero, despite the fact that the title character protests through this kind of behavior, I decided to make a game where the goal was finally to cause as much destruction as possible. So I'm going to jump ahead for a moment to show you the trailer for Test of Titans, which became the eventual product of my mutation-based prototyping. So the trailer makes Test Tube Titans looks like it's just a physic, silly physics-based rampage style game, but the most exciting part of the game is only hinted at there, which is the mutation process. So jumping back to early prototyping again, I needed to find a basic functional system that I could mutate around. The fully randomly generated organisms had proved ineffective at yielding playable results, so I started working with a basic bipedal rig and tuning the physics from there until I had something that worked as a starting point. Now that I had something that could arguably, arguably be controlled by a player uh, through per lane controls, um, which was slightly difficult, but it did work. So given that default, I could start to play with warping this way procedurally to see what kind of results might emerge. Uh, an exciting benefit of making the character entirely physics-based here was that if I mod modified basic proportions of the rig, including weights, I would end up with characters that would move and handle completely differently from one another. And it was easy to observe fairly quickly that some mutations would end up making a character that was more agile or easier to handle, while others were clearly duds. But for me, an essential part of Test Tube Titans was that it was up to the player to make these discoveries. I created a procedural system that can spit out an infinite array of unique body configurations, and the player would need to decide what to take and what to leave. So in the same way that photo mode in Jet Omero had allowed creative collaboration between player and procedural generation, Test Tube Titans was now doing the same, except it was now core gameplay mechanic. But it went deeper than that too. So not only was the player tasked with evaluating the products of the procedural system, the player was also able to influence basic parameters feeding into the system as well. Uh, I created a radiation level, which could be adjusted by the player prior to initiating the mutation process. So the radiation would determine 
the range of possible mutations. So higher radiation would generally cause a type to shift in greater leaps, which could frequently take a wrong turn and turn into a physical defect like the stubby legs. Whereas low radiation would be safer and more stable, but could take many more mutation cycles before significant changes began to take place. I left this power in the player's hands. Inevitably, they'd be required to mutate their Titan to make them larger, but how they chose to approach fulfilling that goal would require them to learn the procedural system through trial and error. Another important player choice involved in the mutation process was multiple mutation paths. To begin, the player would be presented with three initial randomized Titans, usually with relatively standardized physical builds. At this point, the player could choose a Titan based purely on aesthetics, just as a starting point for the mutations that would follow. Now, having established a basic randomized Titan to work with, the player can mutate their organism. And again, the player is given three options to choose from. But this time, they're all products of the same procedural process, which has been run over a shared starting organism. Certain traits may begin to emerge in some of the options. For example, a player may choose to select a path that exhibits longer legs. From there, the player can continue to mutate, building from this latest mutation product. One of the most exciting things about the process for me is that each Titan becomes the product of many compound decisions. It becomes a complex and full unique product. And despite the fact that the player has never had direct control over any of the outcomes, their Titan is one of a kind and a pure collaboration between player and procedural generation. But there's plenty of room for the player to end up with inferior Titans through this process. And from a game design standpoint, it seems risky to give the player the opportunity to create ineffective characters. And sure enough, in early playtests, I would see players choosing poorly performing Titans and subsequently struggling with the basics. So to attempt to mitigate this issue, I forced the player at the beginning of the game to create a brand new Titan after each mission was completed. In this way, the player could be exposed early on to a wider variety of possible Titans and hopefully observe which features and characteristics might be more desirable than others. At its core, encouraging experimentation and failure was an essential condition to giving the player the reins on the procedural generation. After establishing some familiarity with physical characteristics and which ones were superior, the player still had some difficult choices to make, attempting to balance their mutations between the Titan's build, uh, numerical stats, and basic aesthetics. So everything was bound inextricably, compounding qualitative and quantitative values into complex evaluations. And there was no correct choice. And unlike more static character classes, presented in other games, there's no pre-designed ideas around how to play with each Titan. In a sense, I invited the player to seek out exploits while at the same time avoid buggy mutations. Ultimately, the player has to whittle down all possibilities into a single Titan to use. But this creates ownership and encourages a specialized mastery, one that the player can choose to invest in or to abandon after the next failed mission. Player input is critical to the quality of Titans. Uh, to accidentally demonstrate that fact, I added an auto mutation feature to the game late in development. It was a quick way to grow a Titan larger without needing to make any choices. The procedural process of mutation was exactly the same, but instead of allowing the player to evaluate multiple paths at each state, the game would just take one and run with it. And without player input, these Titans almost always turned out terribly. In a way, I feel test tube titans almost gives the player the task that machine learning would have otherwise, taking random products and assessing their performance through trial and error, and then going back to the drawing board and doing it over again until certain rules can be formed that reach further towards a specific goal. Maybe I'm alone in this, but I love being a part of that process. Why let machine learning have all the fun? Especially when the results involve trying to destroy, destroy entire cities with a giant monster. In addition to the basic mutation system, I added a couple extra granular options available for players to unlock later in the game. The crossbreeding and selective part mutations allowed players slightly more control over the evolution of the Titans, while still keeping everything inside of a procedural system. One compromise I made with testing Titans and their customizations was uh, manually assigning upgrades, which could do everything from provide stat boosts to adding new appendages to unlocking special abilities like jumping or tackling. However, these were available in randomized limited selection for each Titan, which meant that some upgrades were only available on some Titans. Additionally, extra physical mutations would scale based on existing physical mutations, so a tail on one Titan would be longer or thicker than it might on another. Overall, I think there was a lot of complexity to the mutation possibilities available on tested Titans that I myself haven't even had a chance to explore. Some players might tell you it was 
too much for a wacky physics construction game, but this was the game that I wanted to make. For the multiplayer mode, at least, I did simplify the mutation elements to simply creating a random Titan and then choosing whether to use it or to start a new one to limit a five new attempts. I think this was just enough player decision to make it interesting. And it was very cool to see how players would quickly identify with their fully procedural character. If it turned out a Titan wasn't well suited for a wrestling match, they could always try something different next time. Compare the drastic difference between my utilization of procedural generation in Jet Omero against tested Titans, where Jet Omero would lay out randomized environments ahead of time for the player to navigate. Test tube Titans was constantly pulling the player back into the procedural systems. The player has an important role in the creative process here. Although player collaborations with procedural systems were a huge component of Test tube Titans, I think any level of interactive procedural generation can go a long way in games. From my findings, having a physics-based control system certainly opened the door wide open for how these effects manifested. But I'd encourage any developer to consider how procedural generation can be used as more than just a tool and make it a feature to allow the player to experiment. So that's all I have prepared for today, but I'm happy to answer any questions about it, or if anyone has any good examples of other games that involve the player in the procedural process, I'd love to hear them. So thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much. There's a lot of love in chat, specifically for uh, Glinda Rod, that last kaiju that was all head. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely charming. That was one of my favorites. Monster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We love Glinda Rod here. <laughs> a lot of love in general. They're, they're very charming. I think uh, it makes total sense to me that people bond with them very quickly. Um, there was a lot of big mood in terms of stumbling around and kind of just crashing into things. People can relate. Uh, <laughs> All right, people, remember to ask questions in the speaker board, please. We do have one question already here from uh, Behalf, which is, I've thought about systems where devs manually examine procedurally generated levels and save seeds for good levels or for good components of levels, but I haven't seen any games doing this. Do you think that's a useful approach? Yeah, I think depending on what the goal of the game is, I think even just building, building a system where the player can evaluate which which levels to, that they might want to play uh, could be useful beyond just a seed, which would be a single static instance of a level. Uh, maybe there's certain like granular seeds that play into it that could uh, not, not necessarily be the exact format of level, but then contribute to smaller elements that show up or something like that. Right, something like a seed for you know the monster distribution, but the level itself is a different one. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, oh, it's interesting. Uh, Kate mentions that they did save seeds on Spore for planets, but that it's way cooler when players do it, which is an interesting point. Um, yeah, I'm curious in terms of just going back and forth and seeing if people, how to get your players to kind of understand that evolution process. Like, has there been any iteration in terms of the ways to present that and kind of getting people to um, feel like they have enough control that they're like able to make the kind of character they want, but embracing the fact that they're not going to have precise control. Like, how do you do that balance? Yeah, I think at at the start, at least, it's I didn't want to present too many options, so it's mostly just random. But um, like the the more granular options that are presented later in the game, you can unlock. Like the you can just mutate the arms, or if you have a monster that you like, you're know, like, okay, I just want to work on the legs right now and give it better legs, then you can just just mutate those legs. And I think that added a lot more control for players in a way that gave them um, less, less chaos to the, to the overall mutation. And kind of, well, they couldn't always shape the outcome, but they could choose which places would change, which right. I think made a big difference. Yeah. Uh, I also think it's interesting, like if we go back to, you know, Kat was talking about the idea of the setting being relevant uh, I think that, you know, the kaiju setting is is resonating with a lot of people and is one where maybe people are used to the fact that, like, the old suit monster Showa era, uh, the, the the quality of the chunkiness was, you know, there's an expectation there. Uh, like, how, what was kind of the order there of did you want to make a kaiju kind of themed game first and then uh, find that this worked well? Or was that partly a purposeful choice of what's a setting that helps justify 
physics and wobbliness that's a little a little clunky. Yeah, it came in afterwards. Uh, I, I hadn't considered doing another destruction-based game after Jet Omero, and I think it was one of my friends, because I was playing around with this mutation idea, and my, one of my friends was like, why don't you just make a bunch of monsters that knock over things? And I thought, hey, that's actually, that works perfectly well with, with what I'm doing, and uh, yeah, I originally didn't want the players to be able to control the monsters either, so they would just walk on their own. Um, but then making it destruction-based, I think that motivated me to add the player control back in because it made more sense for that kind of gameplay. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, there's one question, which is, I guess, also perhaps a feature request, unless it's already there, which is that can players somehow highlight their best, goodest chonker, like a buddy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, would, it would be great to have it where people could upload their uh, genetic code to it some kind of portal and people could see the titans and then download them if they want to try it someone else's. It is possible to share, they all export to separate files, but there's no, uh, other than just taking a screenshot of your titan and then posting it, there's no way to currently share stuff in like a in-game system. I feel like I would want kind of a titan photo dress up mode where I can just put like a nice background behind, put a little bow on there and just tweet it out and, you know, show off. Yeah. I've which is interesting, honestly, like, because, you know, that sounds like a joke suggestion, but it's a real suggestion because I think that uh, that ability where once players are involved, they want to show off this thing that they've made and that being able to share that gets other people to have their own ideas. And I think that that creates this really good positive thing. I mean, even with other roguelikes, I think about the fact that stuff like sharing your DCSS build, like people do it from a mechanical standpoint. It's interesting to do it from the mix of, I'm sure, like your point about different players highlighting mechanics or aesthetics of some people saying, look at my chunky, beautiful boy, and people saying, look at my hyper fast, you know, leg arm abomination. Yeah. Yeah, there was a little bit of that. The community never got really that big, but I think there was some sharing that people did, which was very enjoyable to see kind of what people went for, because some of the stuff that people would mutate was stuff I'd never seen before and didn't even know it was possible. So that was cool. Yeah. There's a really good question by uh, Dustin Freeman. How can we have evolutionary algorithms without the icky feel of being a breeder having total control over a creature's life? Yeah, that's a good question. Because um, all of my original concepts were based in a lab, uh, mm. which is that kind of manipulating nature. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the best way would be to approach that. Yeah. Whether it's just becoming, whether it's just the narrative that you tell with the game and it's less of a focus on, like this, the setting obviously of a lab would influence the feeling of that a lot, as opposed to if you were just nature or something. And you are nature as the, as the player, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting. Some of that I, I personally think about a lot and I think of it in relation to uh, Max Kaminsky and their talk on gardening games and some degrees of like the simulation fighting back of that idea that you also like, you can't breed or like control for your exact parameters that you want. You know, life is gonna, life finds a way <laughs> and you're always gonna be working with that. Um, but it's interesting. Cause it's also the question of like, when you, when you finish with a particular Titan, are they discarded? You know, what, what happens to a Titan you're done with? Or I guess you just keep mutating them to a certain point. Yeah, the, the story or the, the narrative of the game is that each titan will just naturally decompose after it's done <laughs> and then uh, you just save a copy of the genetic code so you can rebuild it if you want to but every titan that you send out into the field will die <laughs> that's one solution of you'll control its life is it's going to melt in 30 minutes <laughs> <laughs> oh that's fascinating um people go ahead ask more questions if you want we got a little bit more time um, there's a lot about a lot of talk of mutant green slime <laughs> going on right now. Um, but yeah, I think that that is really interesting how that setting lets you take advantage of that because I think sometimes that can be a problem with you know because there are some other games that are kind of like monster breeding and stuff. But I think that they struggle with the problem of if the fun part is making more monsters, then what do you do with the monsters left behind? And I think that's a very fascinating question. So melt them into slime. It's one answer. <laughs> yeah. But their genetic back code to the, is 
back to the topic of uh, how do you separate yourself from the ickiness of the breeding and stuff. Um, a, a large part of the story of the game was being critical of that as well. So it was, mm. I didn't want to just, yeah, I think I think to counter what it was presenting as like this creating monsters and storm cities, every element of the story was um, critical of that exact. And just kind of giving the players more to think about in terms of their role in that process and having discussions with other people who were mostly me projecting my ideas and like, what are we doing here? Yeah. That was that was kind of a fun way to, to balance the the nature of the gameplay with the with the narrative. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think it makes a big difference of whether or not the game addresses inside of the narrative and the setting that that's what you're doing from a gameplay perspective versus if it just presents out as a mechanic and, and kind of uncritically and doesn't give you the opportunity inside of the text to think about it. So that's really interesting. All right, well, I think that we'll let you go, but thank you so much for that uh, That talk. It's really exciting. I'm very excited to play some Death Tube Titans. And yes, lots of lots of love in the chat for the various uh, <laughs> Titans in those slides. They're very <laughs> endearing. Great. All right, enjoy the rest hey, of your thanks. conference. Thanks.